Welcome everybody to Church Online. God bless you. Right before we get into the word, well, first of all, I want to introduce myself. My name is Marlon, and last name is Medina. God has given me the beautiful privilege to be the leading founding pastor of Crave Church. So if this is your first time here, I want to tell you that this is family, this is home. Welcome online. God bless you. You are our guest. We are more than honored to have you. Before we get into today's message, I just want to let you know a couple of announcements that are very important. And I want to start off by saying that next, well, this week coming up, this Thursday coming up, there is no midweek. As a matter of fact, I believe that last Thursday was our last midweek because after Easter, we're going to be doing things a little bit more differently in our church, um, a lot more purposeful and a lot more intentional. We're excited about that. And then uh, the next announcement is that Easter online is this Sunday coming up. We are so excited. I can't wait for Easter Online because we're going to be having uh, powerful worship, of course. We're going to be bringing worship, and I hope that everybody gets to actually participate, even though we're at home. Uh, we're going to be talking about how Jesus was in the grave, and he came out. That's what pretty much all the worship is going to be uh, circling around. And on top of just having worship back into our online experiences, we're also going to be having a powerful testimony. Yeah. And this whole testimony is on the premise of that there are little gods in this world, like drinking, partying, sex with whoever you want, drugs. And these little gods don't end up satisfying your life. Instead, they leave you emptier than anything else, more than anything else. But then there's Jesus on the other side, and he's waiting with open arms to receive people and to fill their life, save their life, heal their life, and transform their life. And so that's what the testimony is going to be speaking on. I think that you could actually take this as an opportunity to bring a guest or someone that you've known that needs Jesus uh, this is going to be like the best time out of the entire year for you to bring that one person yes. that hasn't really necessarily given their life to Christ and may be in a place where they're searching. Yeah. And then the next uh, and final announcement that I want to give you. So by the way, that's Easter, April 4th yeah. at 8 p.m. right here at Crave Church on our Facebook. Uh, please make sure that you are invested in actually praying for people and inviting people to receive the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. The last announcement is that in the month of April, we're going to be gathering every single Sunday. And we're going to have the month of April to be the month where we re-energize and refuel the entire church. I can't wait. We're going to have live worship. It's, it's going to be such a powerful, powerful time for us to get re energized or reignited or yes. refueled yes. and um, um we're gonna have these live gatherings but there's a max of 50 that's the cap oh, only yeah. 50 people per gathering we're gonna be having three uh four gatherings on the weekend yes. and if you want to be a part of these live gatherings where we meet in person the only way that we're actually going to be able to accommodate that is if you are part of a city group yes. so we're not going to have eventbrite so you're not going to be able to register through eventbrite to come to our in-person oh, yeah. gatherings yeah. um you're gonna have to go through your city group so if you're not in a city group you should start signing up now so that you can have the opportunity i'm also going to say that we may not be able to host every single person in our church yeah. just because we don't have a lot of we don't have enough time to have too many experiences yeah. Yeah. and we're only allowed to have uh, uh 50 people so this may mean that um if you don't sign up quickly um you may not be able to come yeah. um and if there are a lot of people that we can't accommodate that also means that you we may not be able to host it uh, so I don't know, man, pray and ask God to just help you. But if you do miss our live gathering on Sunday, our uh, in-person gathering, all our messages, all talks are going to be live on YouTube on the following day, Monday. Okay. So these are important announcements. I hope that you uh, get excited because what's coming is powerful. God is going to move in a powerful way. Yes. So today we are now on our final week of our Malachi series. The Fear of God series has been good. It has challenged me. It has challenged our church. It has really opened our eyes and it's been so relevant. Uh, today, I titled it Honor Thy End and uh, we're gonna be looking at the last words that God speaks to the people of Malachi before he goes silent for 400 years. So we know that what he's about to say is gonna be very important for your soul very important for our life. Yeah. So why don't you close your eyes with me and let's ask God to Come fill on. us and to give us his word, instruct us and lead us. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I place this message in the palm of your hands yes. that you may do as you wish. Yes. I pray in the name of Jesus that you may speak to us, remove all distractions from us 
I pray, Lord God, for a spirit of focus right now in the name of Jesus. In every home, every mind, in the name of Jesus Christ, a spirit of focus. Take control of this moment. Let your word shape us. Let your word speak into us. In Jesus' name we pray. We say amen. All right. Malachi chapter 4, verses 1, all the way to the end. It's only six verses, but they're powerful. Here it is. The Lord of heaven's armies says, the day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. So God starts, once again, chapter 4, and he mentions the most important day of your life. And this important day of your life, the most important day of your life is judgment day. And he starts with judgment day. This is where we're all going to give an account of our lives and the verdict of where we're going to spend eternity will be given. This is a day that everything for your entire eternity gets determined. Mm -hmm. Think about that and let that just sit. This is where God starts to end. Mm -hmm. This is where God begins to end. A period where he's going to actually stop talking and go silent for 400 years. He starts with judgment day. Judgment day is the best day for the believer Mm -hmm. and the worst day for the unbeliever. Because if you don't turn from your sin and give Jesus permission to come into your life, your eternal fate is destined for hell. If Jesus is not the savior of your life, if you have not given Jesus permission to come into your life, your eternal fate is destined to be in hell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because going to heaven is never about being a good person. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people think I'm a good person, so I should not go to hell. Um, a lot of people think that the requirement for going to heaven is death, mm-hmm. but it's not your death. It's the death of Christ that allows us to be in heaven. Yeah. And we know this because at every funeral, the person that is leading, it says, we now know that so-and-so is in a better place. Mm-hmm. As if death was the requirement. It's not your death that is required. It's the death of Jesus Christ that is the requirement for us to be in heaven. And so judgment day is the best day. And we must give permission to Jesus in order for this day to be the best day of our lives. We must give him the permission to enter our hearts to save our souls. And so after speaking about judgment day, God then moves on and he speaks about hell. Now, a lot of people say, why are you going to speak about hell? Mm-hmm. Speaking about hell is not loving. You should speak more about love yeah. like Jesus did because Jesus is love and he spoke about love. You should not speak about hell. Can I tell you this again? Man? Most people that talk like that really have never read what Jesus said. It, it, it's, the people, it's the people who don't really read the word of God. It's the people that don't take the time to study Jesus' words. These are the people that actually end up concluding, don't speak about hell because speaking about hell is not loving. But as a matter of fact, I want to show you and I want to prove to you in red (laughs) that Jesus, Jesus did speak about hell. As a matter of fact, the Bible speaks about hell more than a lot of other things. As a matter of fact, you'll actually come to know that when you start studying the words of Jesus, he spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. Why? Because he knew what he was coming for. He came to die in your place so that you wouldn't go to hell. So why wouldn't he speak about hell? Speaking about hell is the most loving thing that Jesus could have done. And so here's what Jesus says about hell. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. So right here we know that Jesus is saying that hell was not prepared for you. Mm -hmm. It was prepared for the devil and his demons. Mm -hmm. But when you don't allow Jesus to substitute you and pay your debt, you don't allow him to save you. Mm -hmm. You're going to where you belong. Mm -hmm. Jesus also says this in Matthew 13, just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The son of man, which is a nickname for Jesus, will send his angels and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Verse 42. Mm -hmm. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Once again, this is Jesus describing hell. Once again, this is Jesus 
talking about hell. A lot of people say, talking about hell is not loving, be more like Jesus. Talking about hell is being like Jesus. All right, we're not done. Matthew 10, 28. Jesus says, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So he's speaking about hell. Matthew 8, verse 12. But many Israelites, the people of God, many of those that are the people of God, or chosen by him, those for whom the kingdom was prepared. So catch that. Jesus is saying, hell is prepared for the devil and demons. The kingdom of God is prepared for those that belong to God. Yeah. All right. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If Jesus spoke about hell, and Jesus is the most loving person, whether if you are a Christian, a Catholic, whatever, or an atheist, an unbeliever, an agnostic, everybody knows, <laughs> everybody knows, even culture knows, that Jesus is mainly known for what? For love. Yeah. We have expressions like Jesus is love. Oh. And it's a common thing that a lot of us know, have heard. Yeah. So if we know that Jesus is love, mm -hmm. and Jesus speaks about hell, wouldn't we conclude that speaking about hell is actually loving? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I want to get a video clip. I want to show you what this speaker, there's a speaker that speaks about hell, and he actually answers some of the questions that the skeptics may have mm -hmm. about why would a loving God create a place or send someone to hell? I want you to listen to it. It's about four to five minutes, and I want you to listen to it so that you can get a little bit of a better understanding in regards to this whole topic of hell. Here it is. But you still, you might think, Bill, but how can this loving God send a good person to hell? Well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. I'll get to that in a minute. But the standard, good doesn't work for two reasons. See, your standard of good and God's are two different things. James 2.10 says if we offend his law in one point, we're guilty of all. If we lie once, Revelation 21, 8 says, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. If we steal one thing, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, no thief will inherit heaven. If we have one lustful thought, Jesus said that's the same as committing adultery, and no adulterer will inherit heaven. Well, that's just three of the Ten Commandments. So if we're going to be judged by that standard of good, would we be guilty or innocent? We all be guilty. There's even a scripture in Proverbs 24, 9 that says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin. If we have one foolish thought our entire life, that would exclude us from heaven. And that's a pretty high standard, isn't it? So none of us can stand before a holy God and say, hey, I'm pretty good, let me in. He's going to say, no, you're not, not according to my standard. Matter of fact, Job 15, 16 says, man is so filthy, he drinks iniquity like water. Thank God it's not based on being good, but on a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? because not one of us would be there. But you might not be convinced yet, because a lot of people really struggle with this good thing. And I was on a secular radio talk show, syndicated across America, and they said, Bill, watch your back with this guy. He does not like Christians. And so I went on the air, he says, okay, Christian, don't you quote me one Bible verse over my airwaves. You got that? I said, okay, no problem. He said, I submit to you that you Christians are unreasonable because you don't consider my viewpoint. He said, my viewpoint is just as valid as your Christian viewpoint, and I'm a good person, and I should be let into heaven. And if your God doesn't let me in, then he's actually guilty of a hate crime. So what do you got to say for yourself, Christian? Well, what do you say? You're live on the air. Well, God gave me an analogy, thank God, because I couldn't give Scripture. I said, okay, you're, you think you're a good person, you should be let into heaven. He goes, that's right. I said, okay, say you went and found the most expensive home in the country, knocked on their door, and said, uh, excuse me, but I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? No, right? You have no relationship with them. I said, but you, you go through your whole life. You have nothing to do with God. You deny Jesus as a son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of your life, you have the nerve to come knock on his door, demand to live there because you're a good person. What does good have to do with it? You don't know him. You have no relationship with him. I said, you know, God offers to be your father throughout your whole life. He offered, but you pushed him away. You said, no, I don't want you. I'm not interested. So see, God is your creator. He's not your father to you inviting Jesus as your savior. Then he becomes your father. 
Galatians 3.26, John 1.12, John 8.44, Romans 9, 7 and 8, John 17, 9, Ephesians 5, 1, all explain that he's your creator. He's not your father until you invite him in. So that's unreasonable to expect to live in someone's house you don't even know. He says, well, you Christians are narrow-minded. You think you're the only ones that's right. And he says, I think all roads lead to heaven. That's what I think. I said, well, let me give you another analogy, which God gave me. Thank God. I said, say you invited me over to dinner to your home. And you said, Bill, I want you to go south on 405, turn right at Culver, go up the hill, you'll come to my house. But that's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I think I'm going to go north on the 405. I'm going to get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. Well, you're going to tell me, Bill, you're not going to get to my house. I'm kind, trying to give you clear directions to my house. Well, the same thing. God gives us clear directions to his house. I think God knows where he lives. <laughs> right? That's not narrow-minded. That's specific He's trying to get us to his house, not keep us out. See, people think God's up there arbitrarily saying, well, this one goes to heaven, this one goes to hell. It's not that way. All of us above the age of accountability are automatically on the road to hell. John 3, 17 and 18 says we're condemned already because we're born in sin. Psalms 51, 2. So that's different than being sent there. We're already going there. That's why Jesus came was the plan across right in the middle of that road that we're all on. So all we have to do is look up to the cross, repent of our sin, and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and he'll take us off that road. Amen. So after God speaks about hell in Malachi, he speaks about heaven. Here's what he says. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Amen. Healing. We all need some healing in this life, yes? And that's what we're going to receive when you belong to Jesus. And you will go free, yeah. leaping with joy like calves led out to pasture. Have you ever seen a dog get happy after his owner comes home? Starts <laughs> wagging his tail. Some dogs jump. Some dogs even like they like they just shake yeah. because they're just so happy. Yeah. Some of them even pee a little bit because they're so yeah. excited. <laughs> See, that's the grossest thing ever. But it just shows how excited they are to be uh, maybe let loose out of the kennel or maybe they're excited to see their loved ones again. Jesus, God is actually saying that when you get to heaven, you'll be free and you'll have joy like a calf <laughs> out into a pasture. Yeah. Like, can you picture just, just jumping everywhere? Like all excited, like, <laughs> oh my God, right? Th that's what God wants you to have a picture of when he wants you to think about when you get to heaven. And he continues, on the day when I act, you will tread upon the wicked as if they were dust under your feet, says the Lord of heaven's army. So I think the biggest problem with us believers is that we fail to explain the biblical picture of heaven, okay? I think that we failed to explain the actual biblical vision of what heaven is like. And this is why a lot of people are not excited to actually go to heaven. As a matter of fact, when was the last time you ever heard a talk or a sermon describing heaven? When was the last time I ever preached something in regards to heaven? So there's this place that we're all supposed to be super excited about to get to, yet most Christians don't understand the actual picture, depiction, or the vision of what God has for us. Like when the typical dude thinks about heaven, he probably imagines being turned into a chubby baby angel in a diaper sitting on a cloud playing a harp all day. And some dude that really, you know, we want to bring to Christ and says, what's the end result? And we go heaven, and then he thinks of that. I don't think this dude is actually pretty crazy about wanting to give his life to Jesus and end up going to heaven because heaven like that sounds like hell. <laughs> and can I tell you that in Jesus' name, that is not the vision. Yeah. That is not the vision of heaven for us. Yeah. To be turned into a baby chubby, baby, a chubby baby angel yeah. playing a harp. No one wants to rock the harp. No one is passionate about sitting on a cloud all day doing nothing. Yep, that's the picture that we've been sold. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, heaven is something so much greater. Think of all the most amazing places here on earth. TikTok. Mm. <laughs> Think about TikTok. Yeah. People that travel. You know those TikTokers that are travelers? Yeah. Okay. The, you, know, you know TikTokers that are like foodies? Think yeah. about all the best food in the world. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Best food in the world. Best places in the world. Mm -hmm. Paradise. Right here on earth. Mm -hmm. The best places here on earth are but a mere fraction of what heaven is. God created a small glimpse of heaven here on earth. It's a small glimpse. 
It's beautiful yeah. here. Everything that we've ever known as the most beautiful is right here on earth because that's all we've ever known. Yeah. Heaven is so much greater than that. Amen. Those places that we are fascinated to vacation are small fractions of what heaven is like. And I want to add this one part that I hope that you pay attention to. Just the atmosphere of heaven will make you want to gravitate towards it. Just the atmosphere alone will make you never want to leave that realm. Just the atmosphere. Just the atmosphere. Just the atmosphere. I want to read some scriptures to you that describe heaven. And these scriptures hit home for me. You want to know why? Because I'm a witness. I'm a witness. I'm a witness. I'm a witness to the decay in the soul that our present generation is going through when it comes to depression, anxiety, despair, fear, and suicide. I'm a, pre- I'm a witness in my present time mm-hmm. of what young people wow. are going through mm-hmm. in this season. Wow. Mm-hmm. And I want to show you Come what on. God says about heaven. Revelation 21 verse 4 says this. He, God, will wipe every tear from their eyes. Wow. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things, listen to this, all these things are gone forever. No more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. Depression will not have a hold on you. Sadness will not touch you anymore. God will wipe all your tears away. Revelations 21 verse 21 says, and the 12 gates were made of pearls. When was the last time you saw a door made out of a pearl? (laughs) Each gate from a single pearl. Those are some massive fat pearls, man. The biggest pearls we can ever wear, like we use them as like earrings. The biggest pearls we've seen. The pearls in heaven are so big, they make a door. They make a gate. One pearl. All right. And the main street was pure gold as clear as glass. That's pure gold. Imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine that. This place is what we possibly could dream of or imagine in a fantasy world. That's incredible. And then back again. Look, look, look at the atmosphere that we're going to have in heaven. Back again. Back. We're going we're, we're to read another one that just talks about the atmosphere and the freedom that our generation so desperately wanting to. But they keep running to suicide. Death. The, the opposite of eternal life. They're running to death, suicide, premature death, to escape the pain and the sorrow when God is promising eternal life, freedom from all that in heaven. All right, Revelation 7, verse 16 to 17. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. So, no more need for keto diet. That's some serious good news. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun. All you that like sweat really easily. Yeah, you ain't sweating that much. Watch this. Watch this. Verse 17. For the lamb on the throne, which is Jesus. He's the lamb. He's the perfect lamb. For the lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life giving water. Once again, here it is. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. That's, 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 that's what our generation wants. Yes. This is what this generation is desperate for. Yes. They're dying early. Yes. Taking their lives. Losing loved ones. Mm-hmm. Depressed, locked up in a room somewhere. Mm-hmm. God is saying, I'm going to wipe all those tears. Hallelujah. So the question is this. Have you made Jesus your Lord and Savior? Yeah. Have you made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life? Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because most people, especially young people, aren't thinking about these things because they think, well, I have enough time. I'll do it later. 
Can I tell you something? You do not know when your day of death is coming and you should not presume upon God's grace. And if God is giving you an opportunity to save you today, then you should turn from sin and allow Jesus into your life right now. Today. So let's take a moment. If you have not given Jesus permission, you need to consider that. You need to consider that. So how can I be sure that I'm going to heaven? How can I be sure that I'm actually going to heaven? A lot of you have prayed the prayer, but you're not sure. And today, I want to reaffirm you, okay? This is one of the most important questions of your life. And the good news is, is that God made it very simple for you to go to heaven. Someone say, praise God. You don't have to go through proverbial hoops and loops and do a whole bunch of stunts to get into heaven. Jesus made it very simple. And we read that because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. In John 10, verse 9, here's what Jesus said. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out. Go into Jesus, out of your lifestyle, and find pasture. Find pasture. Paradise. Heaven. So, Jesus isn't only the way to heaven. He's actually the way and the door to heaven. So, God is saying, heaven is not for people who are good. Heaven is for people in relationship with Jesus. You understand that? Heaven is not for people who are good. You have to take that myth out of your mind. Everybody that you may ask, are you going to heaven? Yes. How do you know that? Because I'm a good person. That is a myth. That is a lie. That is false. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus did not say, I'm the door, and if you're a good person, you can come in. No. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except by me, right? Which is Jesus. He says, I'm the door, and if you want to get to heaven, you have to come in through Jesus. Not through good behavior. Not through spirituality that is vague. Not through enlightenment. No, 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 no. It is through Jesus. And so Jesus today is saying, If I'm not the savior of your life, Mm. if you don't allow me to come into your life, if you don't give me permission, Mm. I can't save you. Mm -hmm. So do you want to give Jesus permission right now? Mm. Really, honestly, you keep saying, I'll do it later. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. You don't know what later can bring. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, you don't even know if later will come. Who can guarantee your life after this moment? Who? Who can guarantee it for you? That's right. Yeah, that's true. So, if you haven't made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, of your soul, of your eternity, right now you can. Close your eyes with me if this is you. Repeat this prayer after me. Father in heaven, Father in, heaven in this moment, in this moment I, humble myself, I humble myself. And I say, and I, say I confess with my mouth. I confess with my mouth. Come save me. Come save me. Forgive me of my sins. Of my sins. I welcome you. Into my life. life. So I pray Holy Spirit. Spirit, Enter me. Enter Enter my mind. My my life. My my spirit. spirit, And lead me. me. Take Take my will. will. In Jesus name. name. Guide me from this moment. moment. On. On. Amen. 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 So if you made this prayer from the heart. And you received Jesus into your life. You just took the best decision of your entire life. God bless you so much. All right. Then God speaks about a prophet named Elijah. And it's very powerful what he says because we can extract some very interesting information. Verse four. Remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant, all the decrees and regulations that I gave him on Mount Sinai for all Israel. Look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. Mm. So God is saying, I'm mentioning the law. The law had to do with all the regulations, Uh all the rules. Mm -hmm. The law was good at pointing out that we're not perfect and that we're sinners. Mm -hmm. But then when you read in the New Testament, the book of Galatians and Colossians, Paul says that the law doesn't bring freedom, it brings condemnation. And so what was interesting was that the prophets 
when they heard and read the law, they kept prophesying and preaching repentance. And they were saying, repent and repent. The law points out to your sin. The law points out to your mistakes. The law points out to your flaws. The law tells you clearly what we should not do, but it does not bring freedom. So repent because. Repent because. Turn from your sin because God is coming as Jesus. Yeah. Repent. God is coming as Jesus. He's coming as Messiah. This was the main message yeah. of the prophets. Yeah. This, was, this was what all the prophets, this was the epicenter of all their messages. And then God decides to mention this guy called Elijah. Now, Elijah was one of the world class. He, he, is, he, he is a world class prophet. This guy did so many things that were so crazy. He was so crazy that this guy didn't even die. The Bible says that he got picked up and well, we never saw him again. He never tasted death. And so what God is saying at the end of Malachi is wait for prophet Elijah to come back. To this day, I believe that the Jewish people have certain festivals where they're still waiting for prophet Elijah to come back. It's so interesting that they're still waiting for this prophet Elijah to come back. And so there are two places that Elijah actually returns in scripture. Three, but I'm only going to look at two because the first one's very complicated and we don't have a lot of time and I actually want to focus on other things, but you can ask me later and I can respond to you. But here's the two places that we see clearly in scripture where Elijah actually does return. And the first one is when he has a meeting with Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Malachi says, hey, there's this guy, Elijah, wait for him, this prophet, he's going to come. God is saying, wait for him to come. God stops talking. 400 years pass by. Then Jesus comes into the scene. Yeah. This new covenant is starting to get put into place. While Jesus is doing ministry, one day he climbs up a mountain. He starts praying. He takes yeah. John and James yeah. and Peter. Yeah. And he is up at this mountain. And all of a sudden, Jesus starts praying. And while Jesus was praying, yeah. the appearance of his face changed. Mm. And his clothes became shining white. And look at what yeah. verse 30 says. Then two men, Moses and Elijah, Praise were talking with Jesus. Wow. So Elijah returns, and it could be that when God is speaking to Malachi that he was going to return. It could be this. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then there's a second place in Scripture that talks about Elijah's return, and that is in the end times. This is all in Revelations 11. I'm going to tie this very, very soon, very quickly, so you can understand why this matters to us. In Revelations 11, um, it says that two guys are going to come during the end times to preach. So remember that we spoke about the end times. Yeah. There's going to be a moment called the rapture. Yeah. This is yeah. where the church goes to heaven. Yeah. And then those that were not in relationship with Jesus, they left behind on earth. God's judgment is going to pour out for seven years. Yeah. Then there's this man called the Antichrist is going to rise up. He's going to be a one world leader leading the one world order. Yeah. During those seven years, that seven year period, Revelations 11 speaks that there is going to be two witnesses that are going to come and preach repent. Yeah. They're going to come and preach repentance. Yeah. During, the, during that end time moment. It doesn't tell us that it's Elijah, but it does say that one of them is a guy who can shut the heavens up and make it stop raining. And there's only one dude mm -hmm. in the entire Bible that has that on his resume. Yeah. And that's Elijah. Yeah. So many commentators say that before Jesus comes a second time, Elijah will actually come and preach. Uh -huh. Then Revelation 11 says that while um, Elijah and this other guy, they're preaching. A lot of people think it's Moses too. That while these two are preaching, they will be murdered. So Elijah will be murdered for preaching. Mm -hmm. And that the people of the world will celebrate. They'll make a party because they killed Elijah. Wow. They'll make a party after his death. So I want to say this. How does this all relate to us? It matters to us because it takes a lot of courage to speak out against sin. It takes a lot of courage to speak out against sin. Mm -hmm. That's true. This is what I believe that Elijah will be doing. Preaching the repentance of sin. Mm -hmm. wow. I believe this is why they will kill him during the end times. And so you and I must be honest about the sin in our life. Mm -hmm. We must be honest mm -hmm. about the sin in our life that we sometimes commit in private. And we have to be honest with others about the sin in their life. But it's interesting to see that when we call people to repentance, the call to repentance is always met with resistance. Yeah. That's, that's true. Anytime that you try to confront someone about their sin, resistance. Wow. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Anytime that you try to point out that God in his word with the verse, right? Mm -hmm. 
in red. It's saying, this is a sin most people resist. Because most of the time, when preachers call to repentance, the people of God, sometimes they will, and not just sometimes, the majority of the time, they will resist. They will get angry. And this is why it takes courage. Like Elijah. Mm -hmm. See, this is why the prophets would die young. Wow. Because the prophets were the ones that would call. <laughs> they would call people to repentance and people did not like it. This is why Jesus was actually murdered. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Jesus was murdered because he would call people to repentance and the religious people didn't like it and the rebellious people didn't yeah. like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on. Oh, good. But I can picture Elijah up in heaven. You know, have you seen like a coach? Has a, a star player sitting on the bench waiting for the like the end play to come, yeah. and and that star player that MVP is just like put me in man just yeah. just, just just put me in man I, I'm ready I'm ready I want to go I want to go I'm I'm ready I can picture Elijah being up in heaven saying God the world looks pretty dark right now come on man just put me in man put me in I want to go preach I want to go preach and call people to repentance and and I'm down to die for you. I'm okay with dying for you. See, this takes courage. Yeah. Even messages like this one take courage to preach. Because we live in a very, very interesting time. Yeah, that's true. We're now, I believe, more than ever, yeah. calling people to repentance brings resistance. Yeah. And what God is essentially wanting us to repent of is our rebellion and our religion. The two R words. Oh, wow. The biggest R words ever. Ouch. Rebellion is living an open, defiant life. This yeah. has many names or titles. Tolerant is one of them. Mm -hmm. Diverse. Mm -hmm. Enlightened. My favorite one. Progressive. Oh. Spiritual. Mm -hmm. These are all. This is when the person does everything. Mm -hmm. They do everything. Accept what God asks from them. Wow. And then there's religion. Religion is when we want people to change, but we don't want to change. It's when we only see their sin, but we don't see our sin. It's where we don't want to be under authority because we want to only be over authority. And see, the rebellious and the religious are like the left and the right in politics. You know, the rebellious just want to live a liberal life. And the religious wanna and, 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 and the religious want to live a self-righteous life where they're pointing to everybody else's sin. And this is exactly what happened in the political powers of Jesus' time. Yeah. This is what would happen to the prophets <laughs> when the left and the right attack each other. They we can live, but when repentance comes, the left and the right unite to kill the preacher wow. Wow. they kill the one that speaks to repent wow. and this is exactly what happened to jesus mm -hmm. wow. the religious the pharisees the rebellious which were the roman empire mm. united wow. because jesus didn't fit both their narratives wow. Wow. so the divided unite and this is exactly what happens sometimes in our world this is sometimes what happens in our relationships. Come on. Have you noticed that sometimes some of your close friends are no longer your close friends? Uh -huh. The moment that you start asking them, hey, bro, I think that maybe you should stop, you know, sleeping around with your girlfriend, man. It's not healthy for you. It's not healthy for her. And it's not healthy for your guys' relationship with Jesus. Guess what happens after that? Mm -hmm. Scene mode. Mm -hmm. They don't want to talk to you anymore. Yeah, that's true. They don't want to hang out with you anymore. Mm -hmm. Now you and your face make yeah. them uncomfortable. <laughs> Why? Because when we preach repentance, yeah. it's oftentimes met with resistance. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. It's oftentimes met with resistance. Today, mm -hmm. repentance is not a virtue. Tolerance is. Mm -hmm. I don't think you understand that. Today, now in our era, repentance is not a virtue. Mm -hmm. In our day today, tolerance is the virtue. Yeah. Yet in God's word, one of the greatest virtues is not tolerance, it's repentance. 
Now I want to clear something up and really help you find a balance in this. God starts with tolerance, but he works towards repentance. Mm -hmm. You come as you are, but you don't stay as you are. Amen. Someone say amen. amen. God is tolerant and welcomes us into his son just as we are. Mm -hmm. But through repentance, we change by God's grace. Mm -hmm. That is the balance. Yeah. Repentance. Repentance. Now God's final word for 400 years is for the men. And this is the part where I believe the heart of this message is. Wow. We're going to get a little bit deep. And I pray that this is like a good conversation between me and the men. Me and the boys. Ladies, listen in. Yes. Because ladies, even though I'm not going to be addressing you specifically, it still addresses you. Yes. Yes. Because you're going to marry one day and you need to marry a man that will not just be a good time. Mm -hmm. Or not just be a, uh, someone that you fell in love with because... Their body looked good. Yeah. Or because they smelled good. Mm -hmm. Come on. You get to listen into some of the things that I believe can make our marriages and our families successful. Amen. Okay? Amen. So boys, we're going to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with Let's you. Go. As your pastor, I love you. And I want to be able to um, impact you as much as I can. Yeah. And be of, yeah. of edification as much as I can. Yeah. And add as much value as I can. I love you. And so I pray that this, this part blesses you tremendously. I hope that it adds value. Get your notes ready, your notebooks ready. I really believe that. I have some very, very interesting points that I believe that God is going to help you with, okay? And if you're a father, if you're a father, this is for you as well. And I believe that God wants to speak to you. Don't take it as Pastor Marlon speaking to you. Take it as God speaking to you. Malachi 4, verse 6. This is the last verse. Before God goes silent. Here it is. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children. In the hearts of children to their fathers. And here's the last sentence God speaks. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Wow. And he goes silent. Mm. Now let me say something to you. A culture is ruined. A society is ruined. Mm -hmm. A country is ruined. Mm -hmm. A nation is ruined. Yeah. It's all destruction if the fathers don't love their kids. That's true. That's true. If the fathers don't love their kids, it's all a curse. Yeah. That's, true. That's what God is saying. If we look at the social problems we're facing today, God is like, I have a solution. And it's dads. Mm -hmm. Come on. Dads. Come on. All the problems that we see, all the social problems that we see, my solution is dads. Dads can do what institutions cannot do. Dads can do what governments cannot do. Dads can do what organizations cannot do. Dads can do what the babysitter will not do. Dads can do what the family cannot do. Dads can do what the neighbors cannot do. It's the dads, it's the fathers. Fatherhood. Yes. The Father's heart. I believe one of the main things that we need for social change during this era is for men to love yes. their children. Yes. Men yes. to get up yes. and love their children. Yes. Men to stand up yes. and take their place, yes. be present. Yes and love their children with the heart of the Father. This is what we need. Yes. And do you know this? We know this. That if dad would have been around longer, that if dad would have been around, period, we would be different. Our life would be different. And so, we must cultivate a father's heart. Cultivate a father's heart. How? Well, first thing, know God as Father. Listen to this. Cultivating a father's heart starts by knowing God as Father. Talking to God as Father. Relying on God as Father. And trusting God as Father. And doing this as early as possible in your life. Can I ask you a question? When you pray, do you pray to a force? Or are you talking to God as Father? 
A lot of us were fascinated with the Holy Spirit because the power of the Holy Spirit, amazing. A lot of us are fascinated with the Jesus figure and the part of Jesus, which is, you know, we have to be like Jesus. But the one that we sometimes forget to think about in the proper context is God as Father. Mm-hmm. We don't know him as Father. We don't talk to him as Father. And if you had a bad, terrible, biological dad who was irresponsible, who was absent, not present, who never gave you advice, we tend sometimes to avoid thinking uh, about God as father because when you see or read or think or um, imagine the word father, you see your biological father. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we don't want to relate to God as, Lord. as child and father. Yeah. Wow. But let me ask you a question. Are you talking to God as father? For real, real. Are you talking to him as father? Even if you've been a Christian for a long time. You know, yesterday I was driving home. And I was thinking about a problem. And I wanted to. And God already told me. God already told me. You're not going to have to fight in this battle. Mm. He told me that about a few months ago. Yesterday when I was thinking about the problem, this problem still kept, keeps poking. And I hate it. Yeah. And I want to come in and fix it. And yesterday, as I was driving home, I was thinking about the problem. And I was going, man, I should just do something about this because, you know, I can fix it. And God asked me something. He said, Do you not believe that I am capable of handling this problem for you? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? See, we can throw words around like, yeah, I talk to God as Father. Yeah, I trust as God. Yeah, I rely on God as Father. But do you really when it comes to the moment? When you have an emotional void and you keep running to a thing to fill that emotional void, are you really... Young men, are you really relying on God as father? Or is it just mere religious speech that you're just so good at memorizing? Does your speech match your life? You have to know God as father. I believe one of the main things we need for social change is fatherhood. And that fatherhood begins when you know God. Yes. As father. This means you obey your heavenly father. This means you honor your heavenly father. This means you must spend time with your heavenly father. So young men, men, older men. If you want to have a father's heart. And you want to cultivate a father's heart. It starts with your relationship with God as father. Amen. Knowing scripture is not cultivating a father's heart. Mm -hmm. Knowing what God wants, because you can know it and not do it, is also not equivalent to having a father's heart. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that in most families, it's the women, the mothers, and the children going to church? Mm -hmm. And dad stays at home on the sofa doing nothing? Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that in the family, it's the woman That is actually the one that takes care of the children, teaches the children, is present with the kids. In most, I'm not saying that all of you, please don't think that I'm generally um, stroking everybody with the same brush. Please don't think that. I'm not ignorant. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that? That in the majority of homes, dad is the irresponsible one who is absent, not present. It's the mom. And you know why this is? It's because most dads may have theological knowledge of God in the Bible, Mm -hmm. but they don't know God as father. They don't have a relationship with him. You have to have a relationship yes. with him. Amen. Number two, forgive your earthly father. Mm-hmm. If you want to cultivate a father's heart, you have to forgive your earthly father. Mm-hmm. If you want to be men who change the fatherless pattern, mm-hmm. you need the father's heart. Mm-hmm. If you want the father's heart, that means forgiving your earthly father because he is sinful. And I understand that some father wounds are deep, and rightfully so. Some of you have gone through some very painful, hard things because of your father. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. And you have every right to be bitter and resent your father. But I'm moved by compassion to warn you. I am moved by compassion to warn you that. The sin that lived in your father will live in you through bitterness if you don't forgive. A big part of God, the father's heart, is forgiveness. You cannot have a father's heart 
if you don't forgive your father, young men. Wow. 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 And young ladies, you cannot have the father's heart if you don't forgive your father wow. also. See, serve those under you. Serve those under you. You want to have a father's heart? Serve those under you. If you men want a father's heart, learn to serve those under you. If you're the big brother, don't pick on the little one. Protect the little one. Because that's the father's heart. If you're in school or in the workplace, don't be the bully. Be the one who stands up to the bully. That's the father's heart. Let me ask you something. Do you have a protector's heart? Because that's the father's heart. One that protects. Who does not like injustice. Mm-hmm. Serves those under them. Amen. Like, can you imagine how beautiful it would be for every 25 year old guy in our church to say to the 16 year old guy, hey man, shadow me. Come, let's do life together. Walk with me. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's good. I'll show you how to tie a tie. That's beautiful. I'll show you how to switch a spare tire. Hallelujah. I'll show you how to make a budget. No one teaches that anymore, right? Mm, I'll show you how not to end up in debt. Mm. How beautiful would it be? In our church, we have young men, right? They're in their late 20s. We're helping the younger men mm-hmm. when it comes to the finances. Yeah. Helping them out of certain situations and problems. See, that's the father's heart. You don't need to have a child to be a father. Mm-hmm. Or better said, you don't need to have a child to have a father's heart. Mm-hmm. In my life, that's been the role that God has given me. Hallelujah. He's given me the ability to pastor, lead. And he's done that through a father's heart. Praise the Lord. To protect Amen. and care and lead and teach and challenge, Amen. love, shape, mm-hmm. counsel, advise, Hallelujah. help. Hallelujah. Not just through my mouth, also in moments of difficulty. When someone needs finances, boom, you provide for that if you have it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, true. That's the father's heart. Bang. All right, D, stop the adolescent behavior. If you want to have a father's heart, stop the adolescent behavior. It used to be that from like ages 13, 14, 15, you would transition from kid, from boy to man. But now in our modern time, we have this thing called adolescence. And you go and spend, or I should better say, waste your time in adolescent years all the way till you're like 30. Oh, no. So from 13 to 30, you're an adolescent. Oh, no. Don't waste your time on adolescent behavior. Yeah. Trying to work as little as you can and get away with as much as you can. Date and cheat as much as you can. Drink and smoke all you can. Play video games as much as you can. All of this is stupid and shameful behavior. And this is not the father's heart for his sons. A lot of you need to step out of adolescent behavior. Trying to get away with as much as you can. Trying to work as little as you can. Playing games as much as you can. Playing games with your video games. Playing games with your career. Playing games with your life. Playing games with people. Playing games with your commitment. Playing games with your responsibility. You just gotta stop. Don't play games. This is shameful. Let me say that again, okay? I hope that this weighs in on you, okay? This is shameful behavior, young man. This is not the father's heart for his sons. Mm -hmm. God wants to build responsible men. God wants to build strong, solid men that will stand up straight. No matter if the winds blow, the torrents come, the rain hits, the flood. God wants strong, solid men. Because men, great, solid, strong men, make great, solid, strong fathers. Amen, yeah. Here's the next one. Marry for a legacy. You don't want to just marry a woman who's a good time. But you want to marry one with whom you can build a good legacy. This one's super super important. Super important. Mm -hmm. This is super important. Listen. I'm 31. I've been there. I'm turning 32 in May. May 23rd to be exact. Just letting you all know. And I've had my fair share of moments of experience when it comes to seeing relationships and seeing people 
enter premature relationships or enter dumb relationships or enter just the wrong toxic relationship. I've seen marriages that end up in just complete chaos. Yeah. We've seen this. You've seen this too. And one of the things that we always talk to the women about is making sure not making sure they don't choose the wrong guy, but we rarely ever talk to the men and tell them, make sure that you choose the right woman too. Mm-hmm. We, we, yes. we rarely hit this. Yeah. See, a father's heart says, I don't just want to marry someone who will have a career <laughs> or have an education mm-hmm. or have a good body. Mm-hmm. The question is, will she be a good mother? Wow. Yes. yes. Think about that. Yeah. For real, for real. Yeah, for real. Like, the girl that you're looking at may have an amazing, amazing education. She may even make more money than you. She possibly even got her license before you. Oh. <laughs> and she may be an incredible, talented woman. But you don't want to just marry for a good time. You want to marry for a good legacy. So the question is this. Will the woman that you're looking at or the woman that you'll choose to marry, will she be a good mother? Mm-hmm. Eventually? Mm-hmm. A great grandmother? Mm-hmm. See, a man that cultivates a father's heart yeah. is not just thinking about his needs. Mm-hmm. A man with a father's heart thinks about their children's mm-hmm. needs. Mm-hmm. Even before they come into the picture. Yeah. Look, there's nothing more frustrating than seeing an absent parent. Mm-hmm. Nothing more frustrating than that. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because this translates to everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then this creates patterns. And these patterns are then given yeah. mm-hmm. to generations and generations to come. Yeah. And this has been the biggest, biggest problem in fatherhood. You know what it is? Mm-hmm. Absence. Yeah, wow. that's true. true. Absence. Mm-hmm. This problem is big. So young men... Are you cultivating a father's heart? Are you thinking, man, if I marry this girl, does this really, will this edify mm-hmm. my children? Mm-hmm. Got to think about that. Yeah. And yeah. last one is look forward to being a dad. Yes. <laughs> yes, pastor. The truth is this, that yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's tiring. And yes, it is responsibility. <laughs> But so is everything that matters. <laughs> Men, if you are a father or you get the opportunity to be one, then we can never quit on being a father. You can never quit. So all you that are fathers right now and you're on the verge of quitting, don't quit. You can't quit. One of the greatest lies the enemy has ever told us is, well, they're 18 now. They don't need me. The truth is, they actually need you as a father more than ever before. Just because they're 18 doesn't mean that your responsibility is out and you get to quit. A lot of fathers are actually looking forward to their sons and daughters turning 18 so that they can quit. At 18, they need you. There are bigger financial decisions to be made. There are bigger relational decisions to be made. There are bigger educational decisions to be made. There are greater life decisions at 18 than at 13. You and I, we cannot grow up with a mindset that says, when my kids turn 18, I'm gone. As a 31-year-old man, I need my dad differently today than I needed him when I was 21. At 21, I needed my dad more differently than when I was 11 years old. At 11 years of age, I needed my dad differently than when I was one. We never stop needing dads. A dad is forever. Fathers never quit. Say it with me. Fathers never quit. We don't quit. Fathers, persevere. Yes. If you're giving up on your son just because you're having a tough day. I mean, everybody wants to be the father when the kid just won a Grammy. Oh, yeah, my son. 
But when the son screws up, oh man, I can't wait till he's 18, kick him out of the house. How stupid. How stupid. I'll tell you why it's stupid, okay? Pardon the language. My mom already got upset with me. I'll tell you why that's just complete foolishness. Because when you mess up, God the Father never quits on you. So how dare us? How dare us as men have a foolish mindset to quit when things get hard? Our Heavenly Father is like this. He never quits. He never stops pursuing. He never stops loving. He never stops caring. And he never stops forgiving. Because that's the Father heart of God. God still hangs on to you on your best days and on your worst day. So how about us as men? Will we hang on and persevere for our children on the worst days? Will you? Fathers don't quit. And young men, if you quit on things when they're hard now, practice doesn't make perfect. It makes permanent. If you practice quitting on things now, you'll be prone to quit on your kids later. And the one thing that we must always remember is that a father's heart, the father's heart, Mm -hmm. it'll never quit on you. you. Having a child doesn't make you a father. Mm -hmm. That's true. Having a child doesn't give you a father's heart. Mm -hmm. Having a child, having a child doesn't give you the father's heart. Mm -hmm. Being the father's child gives you a father's heart. So I pray that you take the first step. And that is entering and beginning, if you haven't yet, a relationship with God the Father today. Father, thank you so much for the series. Thank you so much for the book of Malachi. It has blessed us. It has blessed our church. It has blessed my life as well, Lord God. I bless your holy name. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for everything that you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. We say amen.